Second Chronicles, uh, we're going to be in chapter 7, but I want to do a little overview of chapter 6 before we get into 7. Um, let's pray before we start. Father, uh, again, we come before you, and Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that whether we're in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, um, you speak. The, the things that, that you taught these people in your word uh, in the Old Testament, the histories that we see, it's so similar to the things that you do in us. And, and there's, a, there's just a direct correlation there because you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And although there are differences as far as sacrifices and, and, uh, and those kinds of things, Lord, you were always pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice of your son. And the things that we see in these passages are, are things that are just cool, totally applicable to us. And so we pray that you'd help us to understand these things and help me to be uh, a good representative of, of what you have to say, Lord, as we're going through it. We just pray that you bless the time in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Second Chronicles in chapter 6. Um, I haven't been here for a couple of weeks, and so just as an overview, what's happened is uh, Solomon has built the temple. And this is the first temple, and uh, it was pretty awesome. And what is happening in verses 12 all the way down through verses 42 of chapter 6 is Solomon is praying and praising God uh, for the things that God has done. And as he prays, um, he praises God um, in verse 13, you know, 12 through 14, or 12 through 16, basically, for God's faithfulness. And then he, starting in verse 17, he begins speaking about the fact that his, the temple that Solomon built couldn't hold God because God is omnipresent, like we were talking about when we were sharing. Um, in verses 20 and 21, he talks about the fact that, that God's eyes are on them and that the place of the temple would be a place where forgiveness could be found, um, where justice in verse 22 and 23 could be found, where um, God... Uh, could forgive and allow his people to return in verses 24 and 25, where repentance would bring about uh, an, uh, a situation where God would turn from his judgment on the people of Israel, verses 26 and 27, where there would be healing in verse 28 um, down through basically verse 30, healing of, of the land of Israel, he healing of the nation of Israel as a whole and healing of the body of the people of Israel. So you have healing in that passage. Verse uh, 32, he speaks about salvation. Verse 34, he speaks about protection. And in verses 35, all the way down through verse 40, he speaks about the fact that Israel um, would be backsliding and that uh, he prays that God would allow them to return um, if they repented in the land where they were sent. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Solomon knows his Bible, Deuteronomy 28 through 30. Uh, God warns the people uh, when they go into the land that there's coming a point where they're going to offend him so badly because of their disrespect towards God, because of their failure to keep the law, and because of the fact that they um, do the same abominations that the Canaanites did, that he would toss them out of the land until there was some kind of repentance. And you have Solomon praying about that. And it ends with verse 41 and 42. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation and let your saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the, the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. And when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. In both the tabernacle and the temple, in the first sacrifices that they make in, in those buildings, the one, the one was a tent, this is an actual building. In both instances, when they begin the worship uh, in these places, fire comes down from heaven and consumes the first sacrifice. Can you imagine being there? It's like, and so the priests have, you know, there, there's certain sacrifices that need to be done, sacrifice of the red heifer, and, and there, there's a whole, there, there's a whole uh, situation where, these, these places of worship are um, 
basically set apart for God's worship. And there, there, there's a whole thing with uh, the ashes of the red heifer. And so that, that would be one of the first sacrifices that would take place. And so they've, they've taken this animal and they've slaughtered it and they've, uh, they've, they've taken it and put it up on the altar. Uh, uh, many times they were whole burnt offerings, put it up on the altar, and they haven't lit the fire. The, the fire that's lit under these animals, it's lit by God himself. And it's, it's something to keep in mind when, when you, you think about the way that things are supposed to work as far as us being believers. I am not to light my own fire. So in both instances, when the tabernacle started, there was a fire that literally came from God. And what these people did was they kept the fire going. And so the first sacrifice, fire comes, comes down from heaven, lights the sacrifice on fire, lights, lights the, the, the branches that are underneath the altar on fire, and this animal begins to burn. The carcass of the animal begins to burn. And they would keep that fire going throughout the, uh, the years that the sacrifices were going on. And so the original fire was always lit by God. And then that, that was a continuation. You have the same thing in this instance. The original fire is always lit by God. In fact, when the tabernacle was uh, being dedicated, two of Aaron's sons come in and they're all excited about what's going on, but they've been drinking. And when they come in to act as the priests, they have what were called censers, which they had incense in. And when they come in to act as priests, they light the censers. But the, the place that you were supposed to light the censer from was from the altar. It, it was the fire of God that was to light the incense that was to be offered before God. And what they did was as they were coming into the tabernacle, they just went to a campfire. And they got a coal from one of the campfires, lit their incense, and walked into the tabernacle. And they were judged by God because of the whole thing. They were killed. In fact, fire came out and consumed them. And they were killed because of it. And it was, it was uh, an object lesson to the priests and to the people of Israel that you don't light your own fire. It needs to be a fire that comes from God. So how's that apply to us? You know, the fire of the Holy Spirit is something that's supposed to be taking place in our lives. The Holy Spirit is pictured as a fire. In fact, in the, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, there are little tongues of flame. And I have to explain these things because I found out that some of the guys on my staff did not know what a tongue of flame was. They thought, you know, one of the guys thought it was like literally a tongue that was shaped like flame. Like, you know, like a tongue. Tongues of flame are, you know, like when you're in a campfire and the, and the fire's doing this, this whole thing where, you know, little parts are going up. That's a tongue of flame. And so basically what they had was a flame that was over the top of each one of these guys' heads. And it's a, it's a picture of the fire of God coming down on the people of God who are now the temple of God. Every time the temple of God is dedicated, every time that um, you have the original tabernacle and the original temple dedicated in the Old Testament, it's the flame of God that comes down and starts this whole process. When the church begins in Acts chapter 2, it's the fire of God that comes down on the people of Israel at that point, and they become the temple of God. And that's been a, something that's been a continuation with the church from that point on. This is, this is again, the point is, is this. There are things that Christians do to fire themselves up. And they're exactly the same things that I used to do to fire myself up before I played a football game. And so before I played a football game, I would psych myself up. And I'd sit in a, I'd sit in a locker room and I'd play music with a loud beat, you know, with a, with a driving beat. And I'd get all excited and I'd jump up at the, at the end of that whole thing. And somebody gives some kind of little speech. The coach would say, we're going to go out and we're going to fight. We're going to go out and we're going to win. We're going to go out and we're going to tear their throats out. You know, Braves rule or Tigers rule or whatever team I was playing for. We rule. And then you run out of the locker room and you're all, oh, ah. And there's the, there's the cheerleaders with a big piece of paper that they've written things on, and you run through the paper, rah, you know, and bust it up. And, they, and sometimes you hit the cheerleaders, they fall down. That's okay, rah, you know, and off you go. And I, I've been involved in that. I was involved in sports for a long time, you can tell, right? And Christians do exactly the same things. 
they come in and, and they do certain things and they, they, you know, you can, you can have guys who get up front and they start pumping you up. And they, they start saying things to you and saying it in a certain manner and getting people excited. And it's exactly the same kind of thing that happened in locker rooms with me. And all you're doing is psyching yourself up. That's all that's going on. You're psyching yourself up. And people will walk out and go, wasn't that exciting? The Holy Spirit was really there. No, it's, a, it's the same spirit that was in my locker room. Exactly the same spirit. And I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit can't ever work through that, but that's lighting your own fire. You know, I, I as a Christian do not have to do certain things to induce the Holy Spirit to do a work in me and, and to make me something different in the, in the sense of work something up. I don't need to work something up. What needs to happen is I need to be going along and, you know, blowing it or whatever I'm doing. Just go, Jesus, I need you. I need your help. Will you please light me up? Will you please give me a fire? Will you please make me on fire? And I can speak it in that tone of voice. And I don't have to start, you know, raising my voice and go, Jesus, I want the Holy Spirit to come down on me right now. You know, I can do all that stuff. And, you know, you can, you can get a little thrill when that kind of stuff is happening. I can do it. I used, to, I used to be, you know, I was a captain of the football team at one point. And so I can do all of that stuff. That is not the work of the Holy Spirit. It is not. The work of the Holy Spirit is when God is the one who inflames you, when God is the one who works in you, when God is the one who gets you excited, when God is the one that, um, I don't know, you know. I used to dance in my apartment by myself. Can you imagine? like a ballerina kind of, sort of. <laughs> you know? I, I play Christian music and I just sit, be sitting there worshiping and you know, I, 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 I'm goofing around about the ballerina thing, but I would stand up and I would just dance before the Lord and I don't do it in church because I'm a private person and I don't want to do it in front of you. Nah, 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 nah. You know, you say, get over yourself and I'm like, get over yourself. Get over yourself getting over myself. <laughs> so there's things that I want to, I don't want to do in front of you. It's between me and the Lord. Okay. But you know, I, I'm in my apartment all by myself and I'm listening to worship songs and the presence of the Lord is there. And I, you know, it's just like, I, you know, I can, I can, I can get into it and it's a work of God and I'm, oh, I'm excited and I'm, I'm blown away by God's grace. And there's been times when, you know, I call it holy hugs, you know, hugs from heaven where the chills are going up and down my back and I'm, I'm getting all these feelings and all this cool stuff is going on. There've been times when I just had to say, God, stop. You got to stop because I can't take it anymore. It's too much. And it's the, the fire of God coming down on me. And I want it to be from him, not just from me. You know what, you guys, I still pray to this day. And I'm not, I'm not a guy, you guys know me, right? And so I'm pretty much like this. I make Mitch, I make Mitch crazy. Something exciting will happen. And he goes, what do you think of that? And I go, that was really cool. And he'll go, oh, I hate you. <laughs> Cause I don't, I don't, I don't get all jazzed and I don't get all excited. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty even keel, uh, for the most part. Um, but, and I don't know why I'm saying all that. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the Holy Spirit was upon me, I'd know what I was going to say next. I don't know. You know, but in, in any case, I'm, I'm, I'm not somebody who's emotional. Oh, I know what I'm saying. I'm not somebody who's emotional like that. But you know what? When I sit down to pray, when I'm talking to God, and it can be anywhere. I can be in my office. I can be in my bed. I can be, you know, a lot of time that I'm praying, I'm, I'm driving from here to my, home, to my home or from my home here. And I, be, I enter into the presence of God. And I, the way I enter into the presence of God, I'm not doing something weird. I'm just going, Jesus, I want to be with you now. And when I enter into the presence of God, I'm getting all these feelings. I'm getting all these chills. And, you know, it's just like, you know, and, and I feel the power of the Spirit. I feel it. And I don't, you know, I don't start jumping around in my car and I, and, you know, I've never fallen over, or, you know, in my truck or, or anything like that. It's just like the Holy Spirit is there. It's, it's a cool thing. And what you want is that. You want that. And there are times that, that you're going to experience that when somebody is speaking. And it's not because they're yelling at you. I can be talking in this tone of voice 
um, with, with this kind of emphasis, you know, just talking in a conversational manner, and you will be having a moment with God where the Holy Spirit is coming upon you and working in you. I see, I see, I see it happen with people all the time, especially with unbelievers. Unbelievers freak out when they get in this building, man. There are, there are people who get in this building and I start talking about the Lord and, you know, what He's done and how He loves them and I see people weeping. And I see, you know, I see, I see all kinds of things that are going on with people. And what's happening is the Holy Spirit is touching them and he wants to light a fire in them. Do not, do not light your own fire. You want it to be something that comes from God. It needs to be that kind of thing. And so the fire of God comes down. And again, can you imagine? They're sitting there and I don't know if it was a clear blue sky or what, but Israel's like Southern California, man. And so most times there's not a lot of rain going on. And so I don't know if it's a clear blue sky or if there might have been, you know, clouds in the sky, but fire comes down and I think it's fire. I don't think it's lightning. I think it's fire comes down and, and you can imagine all the people of Israel standing in front of that going, whoa, whoa, and Solomon doing it too. So then the glory of the Lord fills the temple. The glory of the Lord is the cloud. It's a, there, there was a cloud. There was a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day that, that um, went over the tabernacle and, and it was something that filled the temple. It says the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And it looks like they tried to. So they're, they're, they're trying to do what they're supposed to do and they go to walk in and it's too much and they can't, they can't get inside. And it may have been a fear thing. That's, that's absolutely possible. But this is a supernatural event that took place on the dedication day of the temple after Solomon had prayed this prayer. And he prays, and what God does is God shows his approval. And the way he shows his approval is by fire coming down and the glory surrounding. And that's, again, what we want for our lives. There, there are going to be times, you know, God's always going to love you. I, I, I always love my kids. There have been a number of times uh, in my children's lives where they have absolutely had my love and absolutely did not have my approval on an issue. And they know it, and I let them know it. But when, when they have my love and my approval, it's, a, it's, it's one of those things where I feel free to show them whatever I want to. And I'm a, you know, I'm, I know that I'm kind of like this with everybody around here, but my kids will tell you I, I, I hug them up all the time. I'm a, I'm a touchy-feely guy with my children. I love them um, unless they don't have my approval. And then I still love them, but we're having a talk. And sometimes the voices are raised and my face gets this look. And my kids don't like it when I don't approve. Uh, in any case, what I want is the, the approval of God. I've already got his love. I want his approval. I want, I want to see the fire of God in my life. I want to see the glory of God surrounding the things that I do. I want God to, to be shown um, in my life and in my actions and, and that kind of thing. I want, I want his approval is what I want. In verse 3, it says, When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Well, you know, again, what a cool thing that, that God shows himself to be that intense in that situation. I imagine a lot of people were pretty scared by the whole thing. I can imagine the priest jumping back from the altar for sure. Verse 4, it says, And the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And so Solomon's sacrifice was a sacrifice of thousands. This is a barbecue beyond barbecues, man. And that's, that's what was happening in these situations. When, uh, generally speaking, the when you when you look at the the stuff that people in ancient times ate, actually, I, I ran into this when I went to uh, Uganda this last time. I was uh, talking to some of the guys over there, and and they have meat uh, to eat, but they don't do it as frequently as we do. And so, if I want chicken, I can go down to Costco and I can get me a pile of chicken. And in fact, that's all you're going to get if you go to Costco. It's a pile. You know, there's big chicken 
breast. You know, so, you know, and, and that kind of thing. You take it home and you put it in your freezer. Well, they can't do that in Uganda. They don't have freezers. And so when you slaughter an animal, you're going to have meat. A lot of times it's goat. And what they'll do is they'll invite a bunch of people over because you have to eat it all within like a day. And it's the same culture here. They didn't have freezers. And so it was on feast days that they were usually eating meat. So in our culture, you know, it's kind of a meat and potatoes thing or meat and rice thing or meat and noodles thing, or, you know, whatever kind of person you are. Um, it's kind of like that in American culture. And so we, we can have meat every day of the week. But in cultures that don't have electricity or, or freezers or that kind of stuff, it's not like that. It's only on feast days that, you're, that you have meat. And that's what's happening here. Every time that they got together for a feast, that's what they're, that's literally what they're doing. They're having a feast. And so the, the, the feast of Passover, they're having a feast. Uh, the, the feast of weeks, they're having a feast. And so it's a barbecue, you guys. And so every time that they got together and had these, uh, wonderful times of worship and stuff, they're having a barbecue, which makes me like God a whole lot. Because I love barbecues. And so that's, that's, what the, that's what the Lord is doing here. And so Solomon brings a sacrifice. And what, what we're talking about is, is thousands of bulls and thousands of sheep. And the reason that he's doing this is because there are thousands of families that are there. And they're all going to, they're having a barbecue. And so this is a big old barbecue, right? Um, you know, there, there are people that I have known over the years who just make excuses about going to church, and obviously you guys are not some of them because you're here on a Wednesday night. But people make these excuses about going to church. It's too hard to go to church. I'm too tired to go to church. My kids are... You know, and that kind of stuff. And Solomon just comes out and, does, you know, not only am I going to church, I'm bringing 22,000 oxen with me. And, and it's like he's serious about what he's doing with the Lord in, in this situation when he was a younger man. I think that we need to be serious about our worship of God. I, I like going to church. I have to be here. But even when I'm not here, when I'm in, a, in another place, I like going to church. I think it's actually, I think it's pretty cool to go to church and I just get to sit there and listen to somebody teach the word and, you know, look at what the Bible has to say and critique them on every little issue that they speak. You know, I don't do that. I just sit there and, and, and just kind of let it come over me, you know, and uh, allow God to, to minister to me. I like going to church. In fact, you know what my favorite church is when I'm on vacation? It's this one. <laughs> it's like the last year when I went on vacation, you know, sometimes I would go visit other Calvaries and, and stuff like that. And it's not that I won't do that, but, um, uh, you know, the, this, this one time we're on vacation and Bobby's like, well, where do you want to go to church? You want to go over to Walla Walla? You want to go see Tom? You want to, you know, you want to go to these other places? And I was like, you know what? I want to go to the church in the amphitheater. <laughs> you know? And so I just came over and Zach was teaching and, and he did a good Bible study and I had a good time and, you know, and I, I, I critiqued him afterwards and told him everything that he did wrong. No, I didn't do that, you know, <laughs> but I, but I just sat there and it was just awesome. It's just awesome. I like going to church. I like, I like hearing from the Lord. And, um, this is, this is something that we need to not take for granted we, we get to come here in the presence of God and hear the word of God and offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. And this is not something that we're to take for granted. Um, you know, I was just, I'm sorry I'm going off here, but um, I, w I was just thinking about this because um, we just got done uh, with Matthew and we ended up with going to all the, you know, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations and, and that kind of thing. And the whole thing with witnessing. And you know why I, why I think people have problems with church? It's because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, this is, this is going, to, going to church is like going to Disneyland. You know, if, if I go to Disneyland, and some of you don't, have never been to Disneyland, but Disneyland is a, like a Southern California thing that, you know, it, it, it's just ingrained in people in Southern California. You go to Disneyland. And when you go to Disneyland, you don't want to go with a bunch of adults. Because what happens is they go to Disneyland and they get there and, you know, they're, they're like, oh, 
It's too, well, first thing that they say is, are you kidding? How much are we paying for this? And it's like a, you know, a thousand dollars, you know, 1500 bucks, you know, your, your firstborn child along with that. You know, it's, it's like a lot of money now. It's like a hundred bucks uh, to go to Disneyland now. And, and, uh, so you, you go and that's the first thing that you're doing. You're complaining about the fact that it's so much. And if you're with adults, you get in and you go, well, what do you want to do first? And everybody goes, well, you want to get some food? You know, and then you go to, you go around to the to the lines, and a lot of times the lines are like forty five minutes long, and you're looking at the lines, and you're like, I don't really want to do that. Is there some place to sit? You know, <laughs> we can we can go and look at the the characters. Maybe Minnie Mouse or Mickey Mouse will come up, and I don't know. We can make fun of them or something. And nobody wants to do the rides, and nobody wants to because they're all a bunch of adults. And when they do go on the rides, they go, Oh, it's so fake. It's a, it's, it's not even real. Like, <laughs> you doofus, you're, it's never real. But when you go with a little kid, you don't go to Disneyland with adults. You go to Disneyland with a little kid. Because when you go with a little kid, they think everything's real. I've told you my story about Disneyland. The first time I went on the submarine, it was real, man. Everything was real. And I was all excited about the submarine ride. And I was all excited. Everything that I went on, it was like awesome. This is so cool. You know, and that kind of thing. And I, I imagine that everybody that was with me was, you know, not so much excited about the, the rides itself or Disneyland in and of itself. They're excited about what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing because this is all brand new to me. And when I've gone with my nieces and nephews, when I've gone with my children, it's exa- I love going to Disneyland with kids. I love it because it's brand new. You know what else I love? I love going to church with new believers. I love, I love going to church with unbelievers. I, you know, when, when, uh, when I wasn't a pastor, and even though I'm, I'm a pastor, I'll still invite people to come and listen to me. It's weird, but I, I'll still do that. Um, but when, when I uh, would go to church, I'm always trying to get somebody to go with me. And so it would be one of the guys on my crew. And you know what? When you walk into a building with somebody who's a new believer or somebody who's not a believer at all, it is a totally different experience. Have you ever done this? And so you're just praying throughout the whole service because you've been praying for this guy or praying for this lady. You're praying throughout the whole service and you're going, oh God, please don't let him tell that stupid story that he always likes to tell. And then you, and then he's, then he's, then I start telling it. You're like, oh God, please redeem, <laughs> because he, you know my friend's gonna think he's really weird. And oh no, he told that joke that he's been telling for the last ten years, and ah, oh, you know, you're all involved in it. And so I've had people come up afterwards and go, you know what, Steve, you did this whole joke, you did this whole story, and the whole time I'm sitting there, you know, going, oh God, he's doing that again. And then the person, you know, the person was all excited about it. And he goes, I was just blown away that he'd be, he was excited about your joke. I couldn't believe it. God can use your joke, that old one. You know, that kind of thing. And, and, it's, and it's, I, I've had people say that kind of stuff to me, but I did exactly the same thing. I'd go to Greg's church and I'd, I'd have a person with me and I'm just like, Jesus, please. You know, and when it came time to the end of the church, uh, uh, the end of the service, I wasn't sitting there going, oh no, he's going to do an altar call and I'm hungry. Or, oh no, he's going to do an altar call and I need to get out of here. You know, he's not watching the clock. He's not, I never did that. When he got to the end of the service, I'm going, God, please let him do an altar call. Please, please let him tell him about Jesus. Please, you know, I want, this guy needs to hear about you and, and, and that kind of thing because I'm invested. And it's like going to Disneyland with a kid. Now it's important. Now it's not something that I already know about and I've already experienced and, and that kind of thing. It's important now. And there, there are eternal consequences to what are taking place. It's always like that in my life or in the life of anybody else in the room. It's always like that. But when I've got somebody there that I've been praying for and that I'm invested in, it's a big fat deal to me. When I have somebody here that I know, well, just being up here, when I have somebody here that I know is not a believer, every time you guys, I know somebody, uh, I, I, I have a friend here or I have a family member here and I know they're not a believer, it's a big fat deal to me because it's not just about the words that I'm speaking. It's about the fact that God is here and God is speaking through his word and I want God to impact them. One of the, one of the um, coolest things that ever happened to me was my niece 
who had, you know, she'd walked away from the Lord, basically. She wasn't living for Jesus. And she came to uh, one of our services one time. She was sitting right over here. And at the end, I'm, I'm doing an invitation. And, you know, I just kind of routinely do that. But I'm doing the invitation. And she raises her hand while, you know, I'm having everybody raise her hand. I almost, I almost started weeping when she did it because she, you know, she just had such a hard life uh, because of the choices that she made. And I had, you know, I had her look up at me and stand up and I'm looking at her while, I, while it's going on. It's just this very cool thing. And that's what it's like, you guys. And, you know, every time that I give an invitation, I'm not, I'm not um, sitting here just kind of going through the motions doing the same thing. You, know, you guys aren't necessarily seeing what's happening, but I'm watching people when they raise their hands and sometimes they'll do it like this. And I, that's why I'm saying raise it high, because I kind of think I see something there, but I don't, you know, I don't know for sure. And then their hand will go up, and sometimes it's trembling when it's happening. And then I'll have, you know, I'll have them look up at me, and they're looking up at me, and some, you know, there are tears going down their faces. Guys, there are tears going down their faces when it's happening. And so uh, I'm experiencing things that you're not necessarily experiencing unless you're sitting right next to them. This is a big, fat deal. This is a big, fat deal. Jesus does stuff when we go to church. Um, and he promised that he would. Um, he's going he's gonna to be in the midst of the church, is, is what he said. And so don't be somebody, don't be that guy who just goes, oh, I'm going to go to church again, where the creator of the universe is going to show up and change somebody's eternal destiny from going to hell where they're going to burn forever and scream forever to somebody who's going to be, if, if I saw them right now, I'd want to fall down and worship them. I don't want to be involved in that. <laughs> you know? It's like, you don't want to be that guy. And the priests, verse 6, attended to their services, the Levites also with instruments of the music of the Lord, which King David had made to praise the Lord, saying, for his mercy endures forever, whenever David offered praise by their ministry. The priests sounded trumpets opposite them while all Israel stood. And he's talking about worship there. Furthermore, Solomon consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat. And it's because there was so much. Uh, that was going on. We're talking again about 22,000 animals, uh, oxen at this point. A couple of things in that passage. Um, they're, um, they're worshiping and they're offering sacrifice. I want you to notice what he said about the worship. Verse 6, priests attended to their services, the Levites also with the instruments of the music of the Lord, which King David had made to praise the Lord, saying, it goes on. These are instruments that are made by David. They're not instruments that they went out and bought at Ted Brown's. They're instruments that are made by David. And the worship was worship that was connected with the temple. It wasn't taking uh, an unbeliever's song and rewriting the words or an unbeliever's licks and applying them to Christian music or to the temple music. It wasn't, it wasn't that kind of thing. You know, this is a, a situation where David was being innovative, not imitative. And, you know, we, we serve the living God. We serve the God who created everything. Creativity is a part of his nature, obviously. And so creativity is something that should be inherent in, in believers. The, the Bible, when it talks about worship, it talks about sing to the Lord a new song not one that's 1,500 years old. And I don't have a problem with, you know, some of the th songs that are 1,000 years old. Some of the old hymns are some of my absolute favorites. I don't have a problem with that. But when you, when you look at how worship was in the Psalms and how worship was in the Old Testament, it was something that was innovative. It was something that was ongoing. It was something that was alive. It was something that was original and not derivative. It was, it was something that came from the Lord. And I think that um, way too much of what Christians do is just copying what the world's doing. You know, we, we shouldn't be three to five years behind what's, what's going on out in the world as far as, as far as music goes. We should be three to five years ahead of what's going on in the world because we are Christians. We have the God of the universe working inside of us, 
That's the way that it's supposed to be. You realize that almost every major scientific discovery that took place before the 20th century was done by a Christian? And these guys were saying that what's happening is all I'm doing is thinking God's thoughts after him? The whole scientific age that we're in, the, the reason that we can go out and look at things and, and puzzle through how things are put together is because things are put together. And there's a purpose behind it. There's a reason that in Eastern cultures, uh, at, at the very beginning, Eastern cultures were innovative because everybody got off the same boat. Then over time, as their philosophies, their divergent philosophies started, started coming in, you, do you realize that most of the people in India think that everything around them is an illusion? If everything around them is an illusion, then there's no purpose in looking for reason and purpose and structure in the creation. It's an illusion. And so the whole scientific method is something that's specifically Western and Christian. And so, again, we have that. Well, it should be the same thing with music. And so we don't need to be behind people. We need to be ahead of them. And that's, that's the way that things should go. In any case, it's something to, to, to keep in mind. I think, you know, have you ever been around people? Uh, and, and most of this, you know, we dealt with when we were, like, in high school, maybe in, in college. Have you ever been around people who weren't cool? Have you? Right. And people who weren't cool and were trying to be cool? Was it ever cool? Yeah. Have you ever been that person? Yeah. You, you know you're not cool, but you're doing your best to try to be cool. And have you ever seen the looks that they gave you when, when that was going on? That, that, that's pretty much most of the Christian world. The world's looking at us, and we're all people who are trying to imitate them, and we're trying to be cool. And they don't think it's cool. And it's never going to be cool. And so I would rather be a real, godly man who lives for what God has to say than a lousy copy of what the world's doing. And that's, that's again, what we're supposed to be. Not imitative. I'm, disp I'm supposed to be innovative. Not somebody who's derivative. I'm supposed to be somebody who's original. I need to be an original. And so we just follow God. And that's all I got for you. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, uh, again for your love for us. Thank you, God, that you're a God who shows up. I like the way that you showed up uh, uh, with the dedication of the temple. Um, God, I thank you that you continue to show up. I thank you that when, when we come before you and uh, when our hearts are in the right place and um, even when they're not sometimes, Lord, you, you show up and you do amazing things around us. And I've never seen fire fall from heaven, but I've felt the fire in my heart. And I know people in this room have too. And God, I just pray that you'd help us to be people who are dissatisfied with anything less than the moving of your spirit in our lives, the moving of your spirit in our walks and, and your hand upon us, Lord. Thank you, God, that um, we have examples of guys in Scripture like David, uh, who was somebody who loved you, and most, most of the Psalms were written by this guy. He was, he was just um, proliferant with uh, the things that uh, he taught and the things that he wrote, Lord, and it was all something that came from you. And Lord, we pray that you'd increase his tribe in us, Lord, that we would be people who uh, just take the leading that comes from you and we become people who proclaim your glory, proclaim your praise uh, because uh, we're so overwhelmed by you. We love you, Lord. Thank you for these guys. Thank you for the fact that they uh, come out on Wednesday to hear your word. Um, and God, I know that uh, you bless that kind of attitude. Help us to uh, take you seriously, to take your work seriously and and to be people who are in, in love with you because of it. We just want to love you, Lord. So go before us, bless the evening, and ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.